The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the speakers and do not necessarily reflect the views or positions of any entities that they represent. This program is intended for educational purposes. Radio Azim Premji University. We must celebrate our democracy. More importantly, it must be nurtured, preserved and deepened. Otherwise, the greatest human experiment ever will be lost to humanity. It's an experiment of so many diverse people living peacefully under a written constitution. If we don't remain vigilant, actively involved in this democracy, not only are we going to lose our liberty and freedom, but this experiment can turn out to be a nightmare for the world. Why am I lecturing about democracy? Because even 75 years after independence, I don't think we know enough about how first the dominion of India and then the republic came about. And more importantly, how close India was to balkanization. Balkanization refers to the possibility of a united land splitting up into several smaller administrative units who are competing against each other. For the first time, we will meet several new characters on the margins of history till now. Several new villains who are almost forgotten to history, who all played very crucial role as Indian Dominion was about to be born in the August of 1947. This podcast will identify characters and people who were both conspiring to balkanize and who are quietly preserving it. This is a retelling of the most crucial years of the birth of Indian Republic about the last minute drama in New Delhi and hundreds of palaces around the country. Hello my name is Josie Joseph. Welcome to my podcast The India Project. At the stroke of the midnight hour when the world sleeps India will awake to life and freedom. Episode 1 The Princely States. We are in May 1947. It's the last week of the month. Mount Batten is in London, holding almost daily negotiations with key people in the city. And he has a core argument, which is that the original plan of the British Empire to withdraw by June 1948 needs to be speeded up. He senses a terrific sense of urgency as soon as he lands in delhi among all stakeholders his arguments have an impact and the british government of prime minister atlee agrees to a new deadline for withdrawal august 15 1947 it's hardly 2 and a half months away the city of london especially westminster where mount batten is moving around is not a pretty picture parliament British museum they are all in ruins from the german bombings a few years ago winston churchill the wartime hero has recently been defeated and the new labor prime minister at least in power in india gandhi continues to be very firmly opposed to partition jinnah wants a surgical strike to create pakistan nehru patel and rest of the congress party is coming around to accept that partition is inevitable If you look at the map of British India in May 1947 it has two shades one are the provinces that are directly ruled by the british and then there are the princely states which were indirectly ruled by the british through various treaties there were 17 british provinces such as madras bombay calcutta etc of them 11 went to india 3 went to pakistan and three were partitioned but at the same time the princely states occupied two fifths of the total territory and a quarter of the total population lived in this princely states from nizam hyderabad to travancore in present day kerala to bhopal indore and junagadh these were ruled by local families 
who enjoyed protection from the British Empire for external security, telecommunications and foreign affairs. On internal matters, they were largely autonomous. And thanks to the unbridled riches and privileges, they also lived a life of envy for the world. It is these princely states that turned out to be some of the biggest challenges to Project India. Let's meet some of our key characters. In Indore, there is an Oxford-educated 39-year-old ruler. He lives in a palace designed by a German architect. The global media celebrates him for his looks, style, collection of high art, luxury cars and famous diamonds. When he divorced his second wife, an American, it was only to marry another American woman within a few hours. For him, life seemed like a reckless dance of luxury. Meet Maharaj of Indore, Sir Eshwandra Holkar, and this is June of 1947. In Junagad, a slightly younger ruler has just received two white whippets from London. You know, white whippets are those uh, racing dogs. And they joined his kennel of golden retrievers, bull terriers, and packs of hunting hounds. He was fond of providing a luxurious life to his dogs and took them out regularly on former evening outings. Meet the ruler of Junagad. I mean, he has a pretty long name. Muhammad Mahabad Kanji III. We will refer to him as Rasul Kanji as we go along. This is again June of 1947. A few hundred kilometers away from the dog-loving ruler of Junagar, we have this guy, yet another ruler, older by almost a decade. He has just shown the power of an Indian prince, ruler, by audaciously rescuing about a thousand Polish children from Hitler's invasion and bringing them to India and resettling them, looking after their welfare. And in public, he is also a great advocate of integration of India. But according to intelligence reports that we have accessed, in London, his people were getting a yacht ready from a decommissioned British naval vessel to smuggle gold with which they were planning to buy weapons, probably to be deployed in case of balkanization in India. I am talking about Jam Sahib of Navanagar in present-day Gujarat and this again is June of 1947. Not very far from Jam Sahib, we have this younger ruler who despite all the historic chaos around him is busy with his resources and beautiful wife. He is actually on an extended spending spree. The couple is known for their signature jewelry collections which includes a cigarette holder with rubies on it. In Baroda, we are meeting Pradap Singh Gekwar and it's June of 1947. Down south in present-day Kerala, there is his brilliant legal mind. He is advising the royal family in securing the independence of Travancore. He is in advanced stages of planning, including printing on currency, sending his own invoice, and drawing up a constitution similar to that of the United States. Meet Sir C.P. Ramaswamy Iyer, and this is June of 1947. Remember this name, CP, because as the story progresses, we will realize that the conspiracy and ambition of the major princely states to secure their freedom was also a secular project. There were Muslim rulers and Hindu rulers. There, were, there was a legal brain of Sir CP playing a crucial role in all of it. On the other side, <laughs> The cabinet mission recommended a three-tire constitutional structure for the future of India. In 
It is Mirza Asadullah Beg Khan, better known to us by his pen name Ghalib. Ghalib. A difficult poet, Mushkil Pasand. A ghazal is actually a type of a poem. It's not a type of a song or a way of singing. What are these flowers and these vegetables and clouds and wind? What, what are all these things if there's only one thing that exists? Kitne azim shaks or kitne azim shayar the. Or Mirza Ghalib karne ki wajah se Urdu mein meri taaleem shuru hui sahi mano mein. You hota to kya hota? The world of Ghalib with Amit Basole coming soon only on Radio Azim Premji University. Now let's meet the other camp, the camp of our heroes, the men who have largely remained on the margins of history, but who played very sterling role in ensuring that India did not split up into a million pieces. To understand how that group came about to play this crucial role, we must look into a meeting that happened on June 13th. at the viceroy's house the present day rashtrapati bhavan in attendance was mount batten nehru jinna patel kripalani and others the crucial problem that nehru raised at that meeting was the political department which has been the custodian of all the dealings with the ruling families and the and the keeper of their secrets had been frantically destroying burning hundreds of files related to the princely states and in a very unusual moment in that tense times jinna actually agreed with nehru and said political department cannot have this level of autonomy and right to deal with princely states there was one more reason the loyalty of the political department has always been with the ruling families So Mount Batten finally agrees to set up a department which would be in soon called the States Department to deal with princely states and these states department were to be managed by Indians and for the first time in centuries the Indian ruling class was going to deal with Indians and Indian officials the state department begin to emerge under Patel he picks vp menon vp menon is then the constitutional adviser to mount batten the senior most indian official in the british empire those days and patel picks him as the secretary of the states department and it's an improbable story vp menon's because he burned down his village school as a child ran away from home went to kolar mines worked as a miner then uh became a typist finally landed up in the british administration he was not an ics officer he was not from the elite ics but he had climbed his way through the ranks because of his outstanding administrative abilities patel and menon then looks around to see who can be menon's number 2 additional secretary and they come upon cc deshai Yet another interesting character. He's a Desha is a classmate of Subhash Chandra Bose from Cambridge. In fact, Nehru ji and Desha both sat for ICS exam, but Desha came under family pressure and decided to join ICS, whereas Subhash Chandra Bose, as you know, did not sign up finally and became the revolutionary that he became. Desha is now in Mumbai, and. Uh, is heading the indian tariff board uh, patel and menon calls him and and deshai shifts to delhi and becomes the man who puts on file a large number of the strategies for menon and and patel to look into and appreciate and then they begin to look for more people to populate the states department and that department and its files are core and crux of this season of the india project the states department's role was 
at one level well defined at another there was lot of ambiguity a few things were set in stone august 15th british are handing over power india is going to be divided into two dominions of india and pakistan so it was getting into a complex maze now and the states department had just about one and a half months to get things in shape and this one and a half months we should see in a broader regional context few years before this burma was separated from india you know originally burma and india were part of the same british administration there was not even a single road connecting burma and india those days even then it took 3 years to separate the administration of burma from british india and here we have 35 40 days hardly to divide almost one fourth of the world population and put in place two dominions and deal with over 565 at least 565 princely states so the state department was now walking into a mind field of egos that they have never dealt with so within the the large solar system of princely states there were primarily three kinds of players one were a uh, very pro india great supporters of freedom struggle the second group was ambivalent while in public most of the ambivalent people did say that we are part of india but in private they were conspiring to see if they could secure freedom and i think even rulers of places like baroda belongs to that the third was almost like an axis almost like a corridor that turns from down south travancore through mysore bhopal indore junagadh into pakistan it was almost like a corridor through the heart of india where the rulers were and i missed out hyderabad rulers were very keenly committed to securing their freedom and they were not willing to give up on that till the last moment the first clear road map of the future of india without the british empire was drawn up by the cabinet mission in 1946 it had recommended a three tier structure for the future of india at the top of it was to be a union of india so in the winter of 1946 to be precise on the 9th of december the constituent assembly began its meeting and in the beginning as you know we only had one constituent assembly for india and pakistan because it is one unified india 5 days after the assembly began pandit nehru rose up to place his resolution and deliver probably the firmest warning to princely states to tell them that india is going to be a republic forever and have no doubt about it azadi ka zikr humne bahut kiya रिपब्लिक के लफ्ज का जिक्र हमने अब तक ज्यादा नहीं किया था हालांकि हुआ है लेकिन आप खुद समझ सकते हैं कि आजाद हिंदुस्तान में और हो क्या सकता है सिवाय रिपब्लिक के कोई जरिया नहीं वी हैड अ क्लोजर टू दिस इन 1950 विद द पासिंग ऑफ द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया द डोमिनियन ऑफ इंडिया बिकेम द रिपब्लिक ऑफ इंडिया एंड द कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन ऑफ इंडिया रिप्लेस्ड the government of india act of 1935 as the country's fundamental governing document that was episode 1 the princely states on the next episode travancore will realize its destiny as a sovereign state chitra tirunal was a rightful successor to the throne <laughs> the older man sensing the threat instinctively raised his left arm to ward off the attack that reflexive action saved his life the india project with josie joseph 